So we often think of, of the planet and the natural world as being perfect, that if humans weren't around, everything would just be perfect and be happening the way it's supposed to. And then once you throw humans in, everything gets messed up and we're wrecking everything. Mm. And there is some truth to that in a way. <laughs> um, but I also, it, like in this paper, I'm trying to see humans as, as just as an important part of the ecosystem as any other part. And that the universe experiencing itself through us and through planet Earth might also have its own shadow side. Mm. And so in the same way that a human in your subconscious, at least from some perspectives, you have sort of shadow material that you don't want to look at or that creates strange and destructive behavior, some of that might be going on at a universe level as well, and that we're part of the universe or the Earth trying to work through its own shadow material. Mm. Hi, I'm Ricky Doris, and welcome to episode 36 of the Mind the Ego podcast. I'm joined by Bethany Butzer, a lecturer for the Alif Trust MSc program in consciousness, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology, and the assistant director of the Alif Trust PhD program in applied transpersonal psychology. She has an MA in clinical psychology and PhD in social psychology, spent two years as a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard Medical School, and was a lecturer in the School of Psychology at the University of New York in Prague, where she lives. Her research includes yoga and mindfulness for youth, transpersonal psychology, synchronicity, parapsychology, and the subject of today's talk, eco-psychology. Our conversation gravitates around Bethany's paradigm challenging paper, Humans as Midwives for the Earth's Dark Night of the Soul, a transpersonal eco-psychology perspective. The premise that global crises and destruction could be part of the Earth's evolution toward harmony is provocative and leads us to cover topics from animism, cosmic and planetary consciousness, the underlying symbolic and imaginal worlds, ecstatic re-enchantment with nature, the masculine-feminine rebalance, and much, much more. Maybe to begin and, and to kick off the conversation, we could start with a definition of transpersonal eco-psychology and how mm. you would define that. Sure, yeah. So, the, well, there's the field of eco-psychology, first of all, which focuses on the relationship between the human psyche and the natural world and the ways that we can connect with the natural world. And there's research, for example, suggesting that it's beneficial for us, for our well-being psychologically, to spend time in nature, to spend time in green spaces. There's the idea of forest bathing, for example. So all of that would fit under eco-psychology. And then when you add the transpersonal to it, what you're starting to get into is transpersonal is this idea of beyond ego or beyond self that transpersonal. So how does our journey beyond self relate to the natural world mm -hmm. and our place in the ecosystem and in the ecosystemic whole around us? So transpersonal eco-psychology focuses on human spiritual journey that is perhaps tied in some way to the natural world, to ecology, and perhaps even to the evolutionary process of planet earth itself yeah that's, i appreciate that definition and and in your paper you link that then to the dark night of the soul because you also define that and then we'll kind of riff off that but just to to give a definition also of that that process sure yeah so the dark night of the soul it originated within christian contexts around this period of time that people sometimes describe going through when they feel as if God is absent. Mm -hmm. um, so even uh, Mother Teresa, for example, went through a, an actually a very extended period of the dark night of the soul, soul where she didn't feel connected to God, at least in her own subjective experience, even though she was continuing to do work in the world that many would have seen as being godly, for example. Mm -hmm. And over time, you know, there's many people who still refer to the dark night of the soul in the Christian context, but it's also become secularized where it just, it doesn't have to relate to any kind of spiritual or belief system, but this feeling that you are going through a deep period of psychological turmoil, but that ultimately results in transformation of some 
sort, personal transformation. And there's this idea that at the times when we most feel that God, for lack of a better word, is absent, are actually the times when God is most present. Mm. Um, but what's happening for us is at such a deep or unconscious level that we don't feel supported and we feel very alone, um, but we are actually supported in some divine way that then leads to potentially radical transformation in our personal and external lives. Yeah, I love that. That also the the link between that and the planet and the idea of, I know you mentioned it in your paper, the idea of the planet of Earth having an unconscious element almost, like a symbolic archetypal element. How that how would you link those two together? How how was that bridge between for an individual going through the dark night of the soul and and that becoming a transformative process to the earth? How would you bridge those two? together Mm. well in the paper in a way i guess i refer to it as humans midwifing the earth's dark night and so we are actually part of creating unfortunately in a way but creating Mm. psychological turmoil for the earth and because like in the paper i talk about how there's research suggesting that psychological turmoil is a potent trigger for spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And so there's this idea that perhaps for whatever reason that is beyond our understanding, the earth actually needs to go through a crisis, a crisis point for its own evolution, and that humans are actually occupying their niche in the ecosystem by creating this turmoil Mm -hmm. uh, for planet earth, even though we understandably, many of us see it as as wrong, as destructive, that we're over-consuming. But in the paper, I, I try to present perhaps a little bit of a counterpoint to that, that, that maybe we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing, even though it's difficult for everyone involved, including the earth. Yeah. And it is, and I know you say this as well, like it's a provocative idea to, to imply that, I mean, you just take a look around and, and see what's going on on the planet, the amount of destruction, what we might call insanity on a a mass scale to imply that could be part of transformation is provocative. But at the same time, I really, I really like how you know that there's almost that moral paradox in terms of our human understanding. Like you don't want to abandon morals and, and say, well, this is just happening anyway. It's beyond us. But this transformation is something we engage in, I guess, to different degrees of, of consciousness. Like some of us may may have a, an awareness of what our role is. Others might be acting completely unconsciously. None of us have got the full picture, I'm sure, but that there is a bigger picture at play, that there is something, an overarching element of transformation, even though up, up close and personal to, to the world and, and the various crises, it can be almost impossible to see that at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I think that it is it is hard to see that because we are engaged with the unknown. Mm-hmm. We're, this is, is a process that is perhaps beyond our understanding. And so we don't know why or to what extent or how long this ecological destruction might actually go on for um, or what its ultimate purpose might be. But there is this idea of kind of letting go of that attachment that we know what's right. We know what's right for the environment. And that if we just put it into a mathematical equation about carbon footprints, then we'll figure it all out and we can fix things. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like uh, the author Charles Eisenstein, he writes about this idea of, of trying to address climate change through current models of math and science and how Yes, like we need to do this. It's good to explore that as one option, but that not everything can be reduced to math uh, and and reduced to some formula or algorithm that we follow in order to make to save the planet. And so this is a provocative idea in Mm. this paper because I'm suggesting that sure we can use math sometimes, but we also perhaps need to go beyond that into more intuitive, not knowing types of aspects. And I I really had trouble publishing this paper because of of (laughs) the provocative idea. It took years uh, to actually get it published. I wrote it 
four or five years ago now. Okay. Um, but the peer review process took quite a long time. And, and I think it's perhaps because I'm suggesting this more, you could say, feminine, intuitive way of approaching the way that we relate to the planet. Yeah, you you um, include that quote about around, okay, I'm going to paraphrase, but we hope it's the darkness of the womb, not the darkness of the tomb. Like there's this, the, the darkness is a, a renewal process rather than like a death, be that symbolic, or or actually at the end of of the planet, which is you know apocalyptic and and something that naturally you know creates a visceral response. It's understandable to have that that visceral response. Um, I want was it written actually? I was I wonder with the timing. Did you write this before COVID, or was it around the time? It was it just took? before COVID. Yeah. yeah, I believe I wrote it in 2019. My original like draft at, was at that right, point. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that was like just ahead of the curve, really, because I feel that COVID, however you you know you view the situation from whatever you know whatever angle you look at that, that really amplified this idea of crisis and the way that these different systems work together, the way that people work together, almost amplified the fragility the cracks in the foundation of society and and that crumbling process has never been more evident i feel that you know, this term the post-truth society mm. it's almost like these old structures are really struggling to to maintain um whilst there is like you say there's an unknown there's an unknown process in what we're experiencing um i wonder could you talk to that in terms of of the symbolic element and i know because this is the i forgot to say this at the beginning but your third appearance on the podcast your first person that <laughs> i've invited on three times and last time because we had the talk on synchronicity and the last was on was on uh plato's theory of form i see there there seems to be some kind of link and i wonder if if you could talk to that the idea of underlying form mm. and this process mm. Yeah, I, I, and I think that, so one of the reasons why, as you were saying, this topic is provocative is because it creates this visceral kind of reaction, because we are attached to the world of form. We are attached to our, our, our bodies, our sense of self, the world around us, our friends, our families. Um, and we're, we're, those of us who are in love with nature are very attached to the natural world too. Like I, I want to cry every time I see a, a tree get cut down mm. or you know i really i have a visceral reaction to the natural world as well and so to think that we as a human species are destroying this world uh is is really challenging because of how attached we are to it and so what i brought up in the paper as one option it may or may not be correct but there are some theories out there suggesting that the the matter matter that we see around us, including the natural world, is symbolic of something deeper. Um, it, some theories suggest that it's an interface, that the natural world is sort of an interface, and that there's something deeper behind it that our human sense capacities can't perceive, at least just mm -hmm. under our normal circumstances. And And there's the whole field of imaginal ecology as well, which suggests that there's something deeper going on or symbolic uh, within the natural world. And of course, none of us know what this deeper symbolic aspect is. But to just give a more concrete example, I think in the paper I raise um, the idea of Donald Hoffman's theory of conscious agents. And his idea is that this, inter this interface around us is kind of like our computer interface. Like when I look at my computer right now, there's folders there. and But those folders aren't actual physical folders and they're symbolic of what's underneath, which mm. are the circuits and the electricity and what's happening underneath. But cognitively, I can't handle, I don't know what all that is. And so it's just easier for me to click on a folder and open a file. Now, I don't know, I've, I've sort of played around with this myself. I don't know what this underlying symbolic aspect might be. It could be archetypal in the way that Jung has described these sort of deeper archetypes. Some have described it as very simply as information, mm. that it's just 
it's inform in the same way that ones and zeros make up the information, the binary information of our computer, that there's some sort of underlying information. Some describe it as consciousness, that it's some universal mind that's behind this interface. It could be something else. You can think of any kind of thing that's symbolic of something else. Mm. And mm -hmm. what are those things? And, yeah. and I don't know. It's another aspect of the unknown. Yeah, I, I also like that approach of not knowing, you know, not knowing, not me, not trying to fully define the unknowable because it is in its own, you know, in, in the qualities of that. It's just a template, isn't it, to try and describe um, with with this, because there clearly is that archetypal element of death and i know you mentioned this in the paper and the link between the psycho spiritual like possibly physical death but also the psycho spiritual process of death and renewal and how that could actually be playing out and one would imagine if that is playing out on a psycho spiritual level then there is almost that um like david bohm calls the implica order some order behind the chaos and the crises that, that we experience how how would you define that how would you define destruction and death this is a light question <laughs> definitely yeah, how would you <laughs> how would you define death and destruction uh like, how would you define that in the the context of this dark night of the soul and uh, as a message of hope mm. No, I think it's a good question because it relates as well to what you raised about me writing this paper right before the pandemic hit, because really the pandemic was a global near-death experience or mm -hmm. a global close encounter with death. Unless you, I don't know, lived completely off grid and, and knew nothing about the last four years, most people at some point in the last four years were afraid for their health uh, in some way. Even people who don't really believe in COVID or something, there's still, a, it touches on something in yeah. you that you have to contemplate about your body and how it relates to the world. And these types of potential encounters with death really can put the zap on you, for, for lack of a better term, of really contemplating and questioning like what's important in life. How do I want to be? How do I want to behave? And and I think that these deaths can operate at a variety of levels. So that there can be actual physical death. So our earth, there, there might be the apocalypse, you know, our, mm. our earth might die, we might die, our species might go extinct. That's a very real possibility. And then there's the smaller deaths, uh, like the death of a self system, or the death of a way of interacting with the, the earth. You know, again, to draw on Charles Eisenstein, he refers to it as a new and ancient story, a, a way of the, that humans need to come in and into a new way of being with mm. the earth and that our old way of being perhaps needs to die in order for that new way of being um, to come forward. And then just to briefly go back to this attachment aspect that we were talking about a moment ago, there's this idea of also being open to the idea that this earth and us, our species, might actually need to die. And maybe there's something, some wild, awesome, amazing thing that's going to come after us that, mm. you know, I, I just imagine if if dinosaurs had been, you know, had the type of consciousness we had and they would have been like, no, we're the best <laughs> species. Like we, we rule over everything. Nothing will ever be better than us. Look how big we are. Look how strong we are. And then look, humans came around. Um, so, you know, maybe there's something really cool and and just, <laughs> cool is kind of a funny word, but just <laughs> amazing that's going to come after us that we just don't know mm. what it is. And could we be open to the idea of death as a way to usher in that kind of process? Yeah. And this is a a really significant, you know, for any individual, for anyone, like a significant moral, philosophical, existential question to hold when like you mentioned the the grief that you feel seeing the the destruction of nature even on a small scale 
the other day I was making coffee and I was I, I don't know if it was a reflection I was feeling impatient and and frustrated and I was making coffee and I was actually struggling with the machine but I was in just my own kind of tunnel vision and then out of nowhere a pigeon <laughs> flew headfirst into <laughs> the glass of, of the window and it made such a bang and then my initial was like oh did someone just throw something at the window and then I just just caught it flying off and that initial shock was then followed by I hope it's all right like that was that would have hurt I you know I hope that it's kind of survived that encounter with my window and that that example I don't know why it comes to mind but it's probably around you know there is that immediacy and intimacy of connection to nature that feels like a direct conflict between being able to be okay with the bigger picture, like being able to be okay with this overarching destiny of the cosmos. I, I'm not, I don't imagine that's something that's easily reconciled, but how would you, how would you go about reconciling that in order to make space for this kind of process? In my own personal process, what I've come to start doing, and this may change over time, who knows, but when I get overwhelmed by ecological destruction or by any of the just terrible things that are going on in the world at any given point in time, I I do what I can for where I can, basically. So I often try to bring my focus back inward and say, okay, where can I create peace and harmony within myself, mm. and within my own personal practices? Like if I want peace in the world, I need to create peace in myself. If I want the natural world to continue to survive, I need to love and pay attention to that natural world in even the smallest ways in my individual life. So as I mentioned in the paper, I'm I'm just like anyone else consuming all mm. sorts of of products, services, et cetera, that are probably not good for the earth. But I also, where I can try to, like I belong to a community supported agriculture group. And so every two weeks I get this, I contribute to this local garden. And then over the summer months, I get this little box of vegetables mm -hmm. and fruits. And for me, that represents a, a microcosm of the larger macrocosm. And I trust that there is some way in which those effects are rippling out. So the idea that scale, like I try to not be so hyper-focused on the sense of scale, this idea that I'm too small, I'm not doing enough, this me belonging to this group is not going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Instead, I try to focus on this is making a difference in, in ways that perhaps I don't even understand, perhaps at that symbolic level we were talking about, who knows. And then as best I can, as like with any spiritual practice, I try to release my attachment to what I'm doing. So I, I give this, I do this, I belong to this group, I, I force myself to recycle even when I feel lazy and don't want to, and then I let it go. Mm -hmm. Of course, I don't always just let it go because it's not that easy, <laughs> but that's the practice. That's the practice yeah. and the process is I try to let it go and tr and try to trust that there is a greater intelligence or understanding that I don't have to hold, that I don't have to be in charge all the time and in control of what happens to this planet. I might think I'm really smart as a human and that I know what's best for this planet, but that maybe I don't. And mm. so I can just release it. Yeah, I really like that description. And it does, you know, it points to, that like you mentioned, the symbolic, the unknown. There is a big part of the a microcosm, or I guess is a macrocosm on this kind of geopolitical scale. But the models, the infrastructure that we have attempting to tackle the problem with the same tools to some degree, even though there is, there's clearly growing um, movements and, and kind of conscious movements around how to relate to the planets, but to some degree, you know, still using that, that same technology, those same tools, the same way of thinking, 
And the message I got from your paper as well is, is that that transformation of inner consciousness could be almost like preemptively, like if, if there, you know, humanity was a system as part of that, as part of the ecosystem of the earth in an evolution of consciousness, the awakening for an individual as part of the collective is a prelude to the kind of consciousness that is required for us to not only survive, but to thrive, like to actually bring in those new relationships and, and maybe that whole process. I mean, it's hard not to, it's hard not to see that in the context of like the fine tuning of the universe, you know, the, the idea of my last, um, podcast conversation with Arabella Thais was about the Omega, this Omega point being outside of time and like the idea of, of fate and destiny on that scale that, that you're also talking to, but we still have that agency. I think that's, that's part of the challenge to be conscious, like a conscious agent as part of a much bigger system that we just cannot comprehend an intelligence mm. that is far beyond our, our grasping almost. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, there's ideas from, from many different theories in spiritual and mystical traditions that humans are a vessel through which the universe is trying to experience itself. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I, I try to think of it that way, that I'm I'm this vessel, the universe is experiencing itself through me, and that the universe is also on its own journey. So we often think of, of the planet and the natural world as being perfect, that if humans weren't around, everything would just be perfect and be happening the way it's supposed to. And then once you throw humans in, everything gets messed up and we're wrecking everything. Mm. And there is some truth to that in a way. <laughs> um, but I also... It, like in this paper, I'm trying to see humans as, as just as important part of the ecosystem as any other part. And that the universe experiencing itself through us and through planet Earth might also have its own shadow side. Mm. And so in the same way that a human in your subconscious, at least from some perspectives, you have sort of shadow material that you don't want to look at or that creates strange and destructive behavior some of that might be going on at a universe level as well and that we're part of the universe or the earth trying to work through its own shadow material mm. and that it's not going to be perfect at it and it's our job to just try and go through this process in in the best way that we can <clears throat> and i mean for some reason i seem to be channeling charles eisenstein today because <laughs> this uh this other aspect that he wrote recently that I really like is he he talked about humans needing to shift as a species from treating the earth as a mother to treating the earth as a lover. And mm. it's a different sort of framing where the earth as mother is, you know, humans, we've been taking, taking, taking the way that a, a child, an infant would breastfeed. The infant isn't thinking about is this going to run out or am I mm. doing this too much or they just, it's just happening. And, and the parent provides as for as long as they can. And Eisenstein suggests that as a species, that's how we've been operating for thousands of years. And that we need to shift to this idea of earth as lover, where giving and receiving happen equally and both want to occur. And therefore both parties thrive because both are giving and mm. receiving. I think that's all kind of wrapped up together in that yeah. way yeah such a astute way of and a poetic way of describing that change relationship um and it, do, it does seem as well yeah i get that like the over consumption if feeling into and sensing interconnection doesn't have to be a way of outsourcing responsibility but understanding like where where is that where is that interconnection sensed, intuited? And I, I guess with the, to take that idea of the underlying symbolic, those messages, I actually do, I had a, a stage, I say during my awakening, but at a, a spell where 
I was extra sensitive to intuition, to, to vision, knowing. And I, f- I feel that is almost cyclical. And there are times where I feel more more attuned and times where I, I don't. I don't today, just to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't today. <laughs> I'm struggling. But uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I feel attuned. And the difficulty is that the rational conscious mind wants to understand language and communication that is is very very difficult to understand with that apparatus and one of those experiences for me was the only way to describe it was feeling the grief of the earth and it felt like that it actually on a bodily level on an emotional level it felt like i was feeling the grief of the earth and I wonder if we are in this lovership or this interconnection with, you say the cosmos, but on a on a smaller scale, the earth, those messages must come through, right? And on a way that we have to learn, could it be that the, the earth has created the ideal environment and conditions for us to, to form physically at, at, at least? that it also is sending messages as part of that collective to guide uh to to guide the process on on a wider kind of holistic level Mm. i would agree with that because really the the inspiration for this paper actually came first from just my own personal experiences it didn't come from any academic sources uh it, it came from soul retrieval practices that I was engaging in with one of my one of my teachers and some of these practices involve trying to find or or just reconnect with aspects of your soul or yourself that have been cut off mm. from you for whatever reason over lifetimes and kind of bringing those back in so that you start to feel more whole um, in, in a way it's kind of a, a Jungian type of perspective as well and in those practices, I was often at retreat centers that were in beautiful natural settings. And so I was often outside and, and just enjoying the earth. And and I would experience, similar to what you're experiencing, this feeling of grief, like profound grief mm-hmm. that the earth, you know, of the earth, grief of, from the earth. And at the same time, this feeling of like this wisdom of the earth also being like, it's okay. Mm. Like I am, I am suffering like no other. And it's part of it. It's, it's just all part of it. Mm. Um, in the same way that you might see like a, a very wise elder, you know, who has some kind of illness and but they're somehow at peace with it. And you can just feel this wisdom from them that I guess when I say at peace, I also mean they're struggling as well. It, it's both. Yeah, right? I get and that. So, yeah. Yeah, this idea of the earth being complex, like grieving and being with it as part mm. of its process at the same time. It makes me think of, I think we spoke about this actually recently, the process of growth being one of increasing capacity to be with difficult emotions, discomfort in whatever form that may be, rather than eradicating it. And I do find that for me personally, you know, meditation, I use that as a kind of catch-all really, because I feel it it has carryover into various practices, but the idea of grief, anger, whatever troubling emotion, being not the totality of experience and that stillness, spaciousness, peaceful environment, atmosphere, awareness, whatever t- term you you know you want to use, is actually greater than the suffering. And that's a big part of the, the spiritual breakdown and breakthrough and renewal is that ability to be with that paradox and to be like yeah i am really struggling i'm really struggling but there is peace 
there is wisdom. It's almost like within that, there's the seed of knowing that it is part of transformation, that transformation is what the grief is for, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's put really well that transformation is is what the grief is for. I think that that's what the earth in it and or the cosmos in its infinite wisdom is wiser than us. So even better than us, perhaps at holding its mm. own grief, having a little bit of spaciousness or self-awareness around that grief to say like, yeah, this is really hard. And it's part of my transformational process and I'm able to, to be with it. And I mm. still like one of the other things I really experienced in these, these types of soul retrieval practices is this intense love that the earth and the cosmos has for us, like annoying mm. little humans as the <laughs> annoying little children that we are as a species, <laughs> even to the point of, I've heard some people describe like gravity as a form of love. Like gravity mm. is the earth holding us to her in, in a hug. Wow. And, and we don't feel that because we're not used to what it feels like to just be floating around without gravity. Um, but we actually have this, this tethering um, yeah. to the earth through gravity and that it's actually, a, like I said, a, a loving type of relationship. And, and I think that it's actually like when I refer to earth as lover, I also mean that the earth is having to get its its head around that as well. That like in the same way that a parent might eventually need to like stop breastfeeding or kind of however that process happens where you sort of, the, the child starts to develop more and more independence, that the earth needs to kind of like detach from us a little bit mm. in, in some sort of way and stop overfeeding us and overgiving yeah. to us. And that's part of her process as well. Almost, I, I'm not keen on artificial intelligence or I just, I don't, something around that whole energy for me is off, but there's something in that with the fear. It's almost like a microcosm of that process where humans have created this technology that we suspect and fear one day may be more powerful than us. And there is a letting go process and it's almost like the earth in creating the conditions it's all starting to sound quite biblical as well you know the garden of eden uh, and yeah. this idea of creating the conditions for humans to thrive whilst witnessing an overshoot really in terms of our, our power our capability just this idea of man conquering nature that's that is so you know, on so many levels, that way of thinking is so flawed. Like, why, why, why do we have to feel the need to conquer nature? That is, it's, like you mentioned that, that sacred connection that can be felt, that love that can be felt. I use the word enchantment a lot to describe these states of bliss, really, in, in acknowledging that union, the union with, with nature why do we want to conquer that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, it's insane. And I know in, in the paper as well, like you, you do mention that fundamental insanity that are, and, and I, I really felt it when reading it. And as I'm about to say it, like just, just letting this land, how insane this is, we prioritize the economy over the planet. We prioritize the economy over the planet like what what are we doing you know it's that is insanity and it's interesting as well I, I, i'm with the emotion today and i can feel it i was trying to kind of hold it back but i can feel that also in the ether um you know the idea that the jungian model and you, you meant mentioned this and talked to it this idea of individuation being a struggle yeah you know, individuation being something that it's not a straightforward process. It requires tension and it requires, you know, one would imagine the elemental tension of how the earth was even created in terms of, of my science. You might have to help me on the science because, <laughs> you know, like the, the carbon life form and the idea of, of the formation of the solar system and, and the, you know, the big bang and, and all that cool stuff that makes me sound intelligent. <laughs> like, 
on a physical level, there's that tension required to create the conditions of life. And, and this earth, this planet has done that exceedingly well, more than, than many, well, any we can observe. And at the same time, it's like there is a, an emotional, psychological, spiritual mirror to that process. I'm kind of rambling. I hope there's something to <laughs> to pick up yes. on that. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I feel you on, on that emotion. Like it's absolutely ludicrous that we prioritize this consumption, this the, these aspects of the economy over the earth, like over mm. the, the limited natural resources that we have on this earth to continue overproducing. Like it's not going to fly it's not it's just not we can't mm. keep consuming in the ways that we have been and we can't keep populating the earth in the ways that we have been and and it, there's so many aspects to it and and i think that in some ways it's it's also about returning to in some ways what some humans what perhaps ancient what perhaps ancient humans knew better than what we modern humans do uh, you know there's many indigenous cultures or ancient cultures that were much more in relationship with the earth than we are. And I think it's it's actually even challenging for us to understand because, you know, like when I say us, I'm saying you and I, I don't know about others, but those in like the global north or, or more Western, modern industrialized cultures weren't raised to actually see the earth as a being, mm, as mm. as a as an actual being, they see it as an object. And there's a, a really great book called um, Braiding Sweetgrass, and it's by, yeah, yeah. Yes. And she talks about how, the author talks about how, and I might not get this entirely correct, but this is at least my remembering of it, that in her original language, which was an indigenous North American language, the grammar of it works in such a way that you wouldn't say, the lake like that is a lake or the lake the grammar you you phrase it more like to be a lake mm. like a lake is a being it's not an object that you point towards so you can't even say the lake you say to be a lake what is the the lake's being today what is it doing and there was this animistic quality to nature and humans related to that and symbolically as well you mm. know a tree doing a certain thing or a lake doing a certain thing on a certain day was symbolic of something else and we've lost a lot of that in modern culture which has then caused us to create a lot of this ridiculous overconsumption mm. and and destruction i really like that you use the example of, of braiding sweet grass and that um yeah animism part of the fundamental part of, of my awakening was that realization the crumbling of that objectification of the planet and of things into that realization of there's a fundamental aliveness behind all things and and i do experientially like i get i get the on one hand you know, the idea of, of a universal cosmic consciousness that emanates because it is the the you know the foundation of, of all of all things but also the idea of a lake having a spirit trees having their own spirit that animistic variation of things that are not objects that they are alive in a way that we just struggle to define what alive is that for me is also a huge part of this idea of re-enchantment like how, how do we re-enchant that relationship uh so it's i'm so just frustrated with this like like the the severance you know the severance from that um but to play with the message in the paper it has to be for a reason that severance has also, in terms of the technological advancement, we're having this conversation now in, in from different countries. That's miraculous on so many levels that, that we can, you know, I, I can sit here 
have a conversation with you, feel frustrated, share that whole process with the world. So I don't want to dismiss the the technological advancements of that that severance almost. Um, yeah, so it, it is like looking at what what are the gifts, but then there clearly has to be a change, like you say. This cannot it cannot go on. There has to be a shift, uh, a reenchantment process. Yeah, and I think it's almost like any any time we play with this idea of attachment and non attachment, or this idea of in order to transcend the self, you need to have a self to begin with. And so it's like perhaps to reenchant ourselves with nature we had to get disenchanted so that we mm. can reapproach it in a new and different way with the technologies that we have and the knowledge the scientific knowledge we have for example can we yeah approach the earth a little bit differently than maybe our ancestors did even though they were very connected maybe we can be connected in a whole new way when we re-enchant mm. uh, in some way and and i mean i know the whole psychedelic renaissance aspect gets into this idea and i mean i've experienced it myself when i consume a psychedelic substance the first thing to start getting animated is nature i mean mm -hmm. it like the trees all have faces and that <laughs> you know everybody like it's and and you know it's i think it's the more rational whatever parts of us just blow it off it's like oh well it's a substance that was influencing you and you're just making it all up and mm. the end but there's also ideas out there that our brains operate as a as a filter that's filtering a larger consciousness and that when we can it doesn't have to be about consuming substances i mean i've experienced this type of thing after retreat retreats with no substances yeah. at all or yeah. ecstatic dance classes or or anything our filter opens up a little and we can see, we can perceive that animism. Um, yeah. Yeah. And actually what I would add is in the same way that, you know, we experience animism in the people around us, the people we love, in the same way that if someone around us were to have ill health or to die, we would be sad in the same way that the tree with the face in it if that tree gets cut down, I'd be very sad. And life goes on. Mm. Um, and there's even evidence about consciousness persisting after death. So if the tree is symbolic of something else, then the symbol perhaps remains even when the tree itself is mm. gone. Oh, there are a lot of different threads um, or branches, should I say, that, <laughs> that, that want to follow. Um, I've had that experience, which would likely be defined as some form of psychosis in the conventional model, as well as experiences that definitely fit that model. But but in terms of the altered perception, we hear a lot this idea of moving beyond the illusion of separation. Mm. And so often that can remain conceptual. That can be like, oh yeah, I'm not, you know, we're, we're connected. We're all connected. I'm connected to, you know, spiritually to the earth. But the experience of what is seen, like what I, how I feel as me, the, the idea of the, you know, the observer and the observed, but the way I describe it, and it's something that hasn't been as active in my reality. I've just, I think probably because I'm, I'm in, under a lot of emotional stress, just going through stuff in life that has, has dimmed that altered sense of perception, but hopefully it will come back <laughs> soon. <laughs> but, but when it, when it's really present, there, there's just this, this sense, this knowing, this embodied perception of with trees, with the, with the sky, I've been through, it seems to be thematic. Like I had a, a spell with trees, but then also with the sky where I could be in that illusion of separation and just look up and it would be as if the funnel of consciousness, like just this experience of unity, which is, 
I, I find really hard to describe what at, whilst being an individual, but it's just this sense of, I am the sky, I am the tree, whilst being individually me. That, that rhymed unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you made a haiku, I don't know. No, I, just, I think I just did, yeah. Just channel that, keep channeling that. I'm onto something. Uh, but yeah, just that, I feel like a single dose of that can create a powerful enough shift in that way of relating that perhaps with with the earth itself with that intelligence and with the, the intelligence of the cosmos will happen more for people as part of that messaging system there, there also must be a reason why that illusion of separation has been so strong and why more people are awakening to experiences feeling sensing perception of oneness and interconnection yes i mean what you're describing is basically transpersonal eco psychology because mm -hmm. it's this idea of not just you go to the forest and you're like this is beautiful and i love this but you actually experience a transcendence of self in relation to it you know some and for me it happens often when looking at the stars, like the night mm. sky, when I get this, this transcendence of my, my sense of self, of like, I am this sky or, um, just that there's something so much bigger than me going on. Um, you know, I mean, there's even the whole field of like eco-sexuality, which is the idea of like, like I was saying this earth is lover, like it's, it's more like, it's not just about liking nature. <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's this transpersonal aspect where you you are going beyond that in some way, yeah. beyond your sense of self. And and I agree with you. I think that that is part of this evolutionary process that humans and the earth are going through. And the more that humans experience these transcendent moments with the earth involved, the more that it their behavior towards the earth starts to change because yeah. it's impossible not impossible but it's really challenging to just to to rape your lover basically mm. you know and mm. that's in a way yeah. what we're kind of doing yeah that's a powerful statement right there isn't it um because because this topic's come up i, I think that there there is a lot of um links between this conversation and the one I had with Arabella, really interesting parallels. You know, this idea of a connection that has its own almost like erotic element or its own, I mean, the, the, the common term really is the ecstatic, the ecstatic connection to nature. The, the union with nature in a way that Within within myself, I I don't or I haven't arrived at a definition where I, I conflate it with sexuality, but almost like sexuality is part of that same energy. Whereas I, I think, you know, like Jung makes this distinction with the libido from Freud splitting off from actually our center of energy isn't sexuality necessarily but there's a psychic spiritual energy and my sense is is that there is, there is that element the blissful the ecstatic the erotic with nature which also makes me think of um Aldous Huxley's island not brave new world that is an entirely different story there was a way that he described tantra and and the the tantric path that really just landed for me and it was based around this this culture on the island and, and how they'd had their their essentially their, their spiritual utopia and they were connected to their sexuality in a way that wasn't as we are in the west to use a broad term you know more suppression uh, around that but it was based in tantric practice so there was a sacred element to it as well and he describes that, how could it not 
be relevant when we we're essentially the product of like an orgasmic process of euphoria <laughs> so there is that away from such heavy conditioning around sexuality and also a severance of sexuality from the sacred there is that yeah there is something in that for sure that that lovership but also the the erotic element maybe maybe distinct from sexuality but definitely part of that whole part of the chakra system i guess of, of the relationship with with the earth yeah, definitely. I mean, I often think of it in terms of eros, like you're saying, the erotic. Yeah. So like sometimes when I use the term e ecosexual, people are like, oh, so you're going out and like having sex with trees or something. <laughs> it's like, no. I mean, maybe I think some people probably do, but that's fine. Um, but it's but it's about exactly what you're describing, connecting with the eros, like the life force energy that animates yeah. the cosmos, which animates the earth, which also animates us and and that idea that as humans, we can connect with the natural world and with the earth in that way and experience that sense of aliveness. And I think that's actually what people are often describing when at a very just sort of basic level, they say, I like being in nature. Mm. Well, why do you like being in nature? What's it do for you? And there's this sort of feeling of, well, it makes me feel alive. And that's, that's that eros, that life force energy mm. that doesn't necessarily have to be sexual but it's it's erotic and and i and i like that you use that example of you know as human beings we came from this orgasmic experience and you can perhaps think of the big bang as that type of an experience yeah, yeah, you know yeah, so the there's like something for us in that in terms of an exploration mm. um around how we engage with the natural world and what we can give to it so like if you do feel a sense of eros or life force energy or aliveness from the earth, then as a lover, it's your job to provide that back to mm. the earth. And how can you help the earth feel alive and regenerated and, and excited and all of those things? Mm. Um, what can you do even just in your own little microcosm of your personal life to foster that type of a relationship? Mm. Yes, yeah, beautifully put. There was a, a stage I, quite early on, and I always feel just crude using the term like my awakening, but it's good shorthand. But but early on in that process, where there was that yearning to just feel alive in that context, and and the way, and I'm not living this right now to be honest. I'm a little in my own kind of hermitage, so I'm <laughs> well getting nature more than I am, but this yearning and this receptivity and sensitivity to the most basic and yet most profound experiences, like just being outside when it rains, rather than this conditioned response, oh, it's raining, I'm gonna get wet, I've got to try and get out of this, actually just like, what if I go outside when it's raining, because it's raining, and I just feel, feel the raindrops on my face, feel that connection, maybe take my shoes off if I'm feeling brave, you know, and that, I think some people were more naturally attuned to that th than I am. So for me, it just really felt like, like you say, it's different from being in nature and just like, oh yeah, I like, I like being here is a good place to be, but, but to that more embodied harmony with the process of there's some alchemy in raindrops and skin there, there's alchemy in in wind and skin to use that again but, but you know that there's there are processes i think that we're not aware of you know reading um i have to try and find a link to this but i read about a study that explored the scent the trees give off that is part of the the well-being that humans experience is, is to do with receptors in the nose because of the the particular not a pheromone but some particle that trees emanate is received as, and we might not even know that we're smelling it and that yet there's a, an increase in our well-being like these invisible but that still linked to the physical realms as well as the spiritual and the the invisible in the sense of 
undetectable by by any kind of modern technology but um yeah there's a lot there's a lot there around that the simplicity of nature actually being the the, the thing we need the most yes i mean i completely relate to that I, in my view and of course nothing applies to everyone but i think that one of the main things that many of us can do to actually get out of a funk in a way is to do what you're talking about, like go and walk around in the rain or mm. like some of my most trans, almost all of my most transformational moments in life is when I let go of even just a little bit of this modern sort of, oh, I don't want to get wet or especially the one like, oh, I don't want to get dirty. Like try yeah. just like taking off your clothes and rolling around in mud or like, yeah. or like rubbing clay all over your body and then jumping in a lake. Like it's, it's, it's such a um, primal and healing process to mm. connect with the earth in that way. Even the most simple kind of act of either if you can take your shoes off, putting your bare feet on the earth or in the winter, you know, those of us who get cold winter might not want to do that. Uh, but putting your hands, even if it's cold, like putting your hand on the ground or putting your hand in the snow, mm. it can be really healing and grounding uh, to do that because you're then connecting with that that life force energy that yeah. we are. Yeah. Yeah, and it's almost like there is a permeability on that physical domain. Like even with with light obviously separate from the earth but responsible for it <laughs> but the idea of you don't have the same response to sunlight if you stay indoors even if you you've got a bright apartment and the wind you know you've got windows compared to actually being out almost like those those um photons traveling to, to contact you know that this way of relating on an enchanted level, and this is just on the on the physical plane as well. You know, the, the idea of like you say, just just uh, the term rewildling comes to mind. And I, I think I wanna say, is it Marion Woodman? I feel like there's a Jungian a Jungian analyst who uh has had a big influence and in Clarissa, the, the uh, women who run with wolves is a, a good example of that. Very much part of the feminine path, it seems. To, to some degree but absolutely essential and and if as well this you know if this dark night and my sense it, it is that as well as the turmoil and the death and resurrection there's a rebalancing of masculine and feminine i think that's clear that there's an imbalance at the moment i wonder if that is part of the, the earth's process as well to address that that imbalance on 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 you know spiritual and a physical way the way that we relate from from those more masculine tendencies of conquering nature is that is that unfair maybe that's unfair but the idea of, of power versus receptivity and these different dynamics in that masculine feminine dance with nature absolutely yeah i think that that's part of what i'm even proposing in the, the paper as well is approaching our environmental and ecological situation from a more feminine perspective. So first of all, yes, bringing in those more feminine principles of receptivity as opposed to domination or, um, or conquering, um, being receptive <clears throat> to what the other might have to share or to offer of their own volition um, and making sure that that person is receptive before going into some sort of next step. Um, and also just being in that unknown process is is a very sort of more feminine, intuitive, um, you can see it more like a spiral as opposed to linear, like we mm. are progressing towards mm, some sort of end goal that's yeah. going to be success. But instead we are we are in a process and sometimes we go backwards and sometimes we go forwards or up or down uh, and and trusting. Yeah, what that process might be. Yeah, it makes me think of the. Um, I think it's called the end of history illusion. Mm. There's a philosopher whose name I can't remember, 
who argues that we've passed the point of man's like you say success but but whatever we were pursuing we've reached that point and we've gone past it and now we're in a decline i don't i don't know the the concept well enough to say whether that's from a nihilistic kind of point of view or whether it is through from this like as you said that this sense of that that trajectory part of the crumbling is the realization that it's not going to happen not not as we as 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 we or the collective egoic striving for technological excellence and the, the conquering of nature like that's not going to work that's actually not going to come into fruition in terms of it requires a greater rebalancing because it's so out of touch with nature and that is something you mentioned in the paper as well around the idea of being in harmony and that part of this whole process is one to harmonize even though there is occasionally violence in that process there is destruction in that process but if we do harmonize increasingly that's gonna one would imagine harmonize the earth as well mm. yeah I would, I would agree i think that it's part of that yeah that process of harmonizing and trusting and doing what we can at our microcosmic level that then contributes to this process because I, you know i don't even like to refer to it as again, as if we're on some linear journey that's supposed to get somewhere because we don't even know, as you said, what the end point is. And mm. and it's very obvious that this kind of more capitalist, technological, patriarchal, all those different words, whatever you want to call it, strategy isn't working. And, and actually, as far as technology goes, things were supposed to be easier now. It was mm. supposed to be that the robots had taken over all our jobs by now. <laughs> we were just all relaxing and <laughs> Um, I don't think anyone feels like technology has made things easier. In fact, I feel like we all actually have more on our place because it mm. is easier to do more and to access more. It's information overload. And and how can we, like a lot of this for me is also about how can we just return to a place where simply being is okay? And it's okay to just slow down and to not call, have to conquer anything mm. <laughs> And to actually just experience the rain on your skin or or the wind, whatever it might be, and for that to just be enough. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a not I don't I use the word mundane in terms of like what Maslow might say, the mirac miraculous in the mundane, in terms of like a a mundane utopia. You know, what what kind of utopia has you know collectively has capitalism been looking for? What kind of utopia is it easy to fall into the vision of, like as a conscious person or a spiritual person, and you dream up all these, you know, these these grandiose visions of of what the new earth looks like, but maybe it is actually as mundane and profound and life shifting for where we are, we are at in terms of we can just enjoy being. We can mm -hmm. just, in, we can just enjoy being. Mm -hmm. We've got permission, society supports us in the enjoyment of being. And it's as simple and as beautiful as that. Yeah, I think even Maslow referred to it as eusychia, maybe. I might have that term wrong, but this idea of what humanity might look oh, like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If everyone was self-actualized or self-actualizing. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of idea because Maslow referred to, to these maybe higher needs as, as being needs, not mm. doing needs, but being. So this idea of, and I was just speaking to a friend about it the other day, to just be able to look out the window and see some birds and that's it. And not feel like you have to be doing something, but you're allowed to just be there experiencing that moment because part really, you know, from some of these perspectives, our ultimate purpose as humans is to give the universe the experience of itself through mm. us. And so really our purpose from that level is just to be, is, is so the universe can have its experience. It's not yeah. for us to get a certain job or to have a certain amount of money or certain clothing or 
whatever you might imagine. It's actually just to be having our experience. And I would argue having these types of um, ecstatic experiences is particularly, I don't want to say anything's valued more or less than anything else, but there's just something I think really potent there for us in yeah. terms of our human exploration of this. Yeah. And whilst, because I'm, I'm just like, so I'm super skeptical <laughs> all the time. And like, for me, I think it's whilst, whilst being aware of the trap of conceptualizing the ecstatic to the degree I've just, I've just seen the, the, the impact of that, like in, in some communities that, that can just conceptualize the, the ecstasy, but that em embodied truth in that, that those movements is like you say, it's incredibly powerful dynamic shift in, mm -hmm. and that's what this is calling for, right? Like a shift in dynamic, which as you point to may may be destiny anyway it may be something that we're already called forth towards whether we realize it or not yeah and i would agree with you i think that there can be a real trap in this ecstasy as an up and out mm, type of thing mm -hmm. and ecstasy as in like you have to have some wild self-transcendent experience that that's that's just radical um but when I use the term ecstasy in that way, just looking up at the night sky to me is like an ecstatic experience, even mm. though I'm not, I'm not having like a really extreme mystical experience. Um, but I think that there's, there's something in, in experiencing the ecstatic and maybe ecstatic isn't quite the right word, but like in relation to the article, I mean it even in terms of the dark night of the soul being a place of ecstasy or like intense embodied being mm. in an experience yeah yeah it's a really nice way of articulating it it, it also how, how are you doing for time bethany i just want to check um, yeah yeah no i'm good mm -hmm. yeah um you know ramdas talks to this and it's something i i've sampled as well like the paradox of actually being able to experience joy in contexts where joy feels like it should be at odds like he he used it as the uh to describe his experiences working with the death uh, the um the dying and essentially being with them on their deathbed whilst experiencing joy and he was like it sounds like such a a conflict like there's some kind of moral breakdown but it's actually going back to that spaciousness around grief, around whatever emotions are there, almost like that. Again, the feminine path, like if you really invite in experience, you find that most of the fear is an illusion. And there is, you, like you could say, you could say pleasure. I've, I've definitely experienced, for, like for me, grief, like actual grief is is not, I don't know, pleasurable doesn't feel like the right word, but there's an element to actual grief that is that catharsis that is connecting. It connects me to myself, my emotionality, but there's also an expanse. And it's not the grief for me, it's a suppression of the grief that is actually the suffering. Like if I'm ignoring that and I feel constricted, that's when other feelings come in that, that are not pleasant but the grief itself, almost any emotion when invited and felt in its fullness without that judgment of the mind can have that degree of spaciousness. And yeah, I guess, I guess pleasure. I don't know if that's the accurate way of describing it, but some, these experiences, they're like watercolor paintings rather than like black or white. And, and it really can be that for example, depression is almost like there's just a lot of black ink a lot of the time, despite all these different vibrance, you know, vibrancy of colors, whatever you're experiencing in life, a shift, an awakened shift can do that with joy. So that there's, I don't know, what, what, what color would joy be like purple or whatever, <laughs> you know, but there's, there's that color, that tone to even the, the most 
difficult experiences almost Mm -hmm. yeah what comes to my mind when you're speaking there is emotions such as um, nostalgia or Mm. a feeling of bittersweetness it's like nostalgia is a really good example of 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 joy and, and kind of grief at the same time where you just have this like sweet feeling in your heart for something that happened in the past that you're also grieving that isn't there anymore but you can experience the sweetness at the same time mm. or or this bitter sweetness or i agree with you there's times when if i just let myself go into the emotion of what i'm experiencing even if it's a difficult emotion and especially for me it works with music especially like if i just put on like a some sort of emotive type of music while i'm feeling this way and i just let myself go into it like you said it can be cathartic um and it can be sort of pleasurable just to mm. allow yourself to feel how you're feeling and not try and and suppress it and i think that men and women you know to get to this masculine and feminine have both in different ways been taught to suppress their emotions you know the the classic kind of ma- male perspective is that you know don't be a crybaby don't be you're not allowed to have emotion and from the female perspective it's you know you're too much you're being hysterical mm. don't show too much emotion you need to simmer down you need to calm down why are you so sensitive these types of things that drive me crazy <laughs> <laughs> so so i think that when you actually are just allowed to feel how you're feeling even if that means that you throw a temper tantrum and you scream and you as long as you're not like physically assaulting anyone or hurting anybody it can actually be so, it can be very pleasurable to throw a temper tantrum or to have like a huge cry where you just like, and, you know, it makes me think of of what I wrote about in this article in in a similar way of, of, you know, we think in our immense intelligence that the earth is just, like we were talking about before, only grieving, that the earth is Mm. just grieving and that the grieving is awful and it needs to stop. But what if the earth is going through a similar type of process where it feels kind of, pleasurable to just let things out the volcano erupts you know the hurricane comes like yeah maybe that feels kind of good that sort of kali-esque destruction yeah Yeah, that's a really nice yeah nice way of looking at it and as well as an extension of that like if there is a if we are if mind if emotion is a microcosm of this upscale and the earth would then scaled up to the solar systems, the sun, you know, it would, it would expand and expand to the cosmos, but the things we experience, particularly archetypally can also be experienced by the earth, by the cosmos. And I say that as a, a kind of preamble to this idea of the cosmic joke, Like, if I was to walk outside, go on a walk in the forest after this conversation, and a bird shits on my face, <laughs> right? It's like may- maybe the earth also has a sense of humor. And the- these things like that bird flying into my window, hopefully, again, hopefully it was fine. I'm not a psychopath, I hope it's all right. <laughs> but there's that humor element to the way that it it jolted me out of this narrow-minded frustration that I was that I was in at that time. So maybe there is also that just various like you say, it's not all tone, not all grief, but but many different tones to, mm-hmm. to almost like a the earth's earth's emotionality that is expressed in ways that we just see as abstract or, or kind of random, but there is actually an intelligence that is is based in emotionality as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, I'm glad you brought in humor because I think it's something that we don't mm, embody think about process experience enough on the spiritual path we get very serious on the spiritual path and and i think that most certainly the universe and the earth have a sense of humor the trickster archetype has become Mm -hmm. just one of my favorites the when you know again it's us smart intelligent humans that think we know it all the second you think you have it all figured out and that like it happens to me all the time where I'm I'm hoping to go into nature and have this beautiful experience and there there's like a jackhammer doing construction in the <laughs> local park or you know this kind of thing yeah. and, and it's like you know I don't know why these things happen but they do jolt us into mm-hmm. sort of a, a certain awareness they make us smile they they take us out of this overly serious 
intensity that we can often get into, especially those types of humans who worry about the environment and mm. worry about themselves and their own development and the people they love and humanity. And we can get very serious and, and it can be it can be nice to just lift ourselves out of that a little bit every once in a while. And and I really do think that the earth does express emotionality. Um, like I was saying to you in a previous conversation, um, after the the mass shooting that happened in Prague mm. um, earlier, a couple hours later that evening, it just started torrentially downpouring in the middle of December when it doesn't usually rain like that. And it was a thunderstorm, which I we very rarely get in the winter months in, mm. in Prague. And the thunder was so loud and the, the rain was was so intense. And, and for three days after, it just continued. And there was just something about that that felt like the earth was in some way reflecting in its own way the emotion of the humans yeah. involved. I'm I'm conscious of the time because I can feel... <laughs> yes, I, I we could go many directions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is... Um, we could pick this up again you know, if we, we have another another conversation um another, another recording but it just is around this the emotional aspect and how i think we we discussed this in the the theory of form but the old paradigm way of looking at whether metaphors for emotion would be you're human you have an imagination you have the ability to make correlations that don't really exist, but there's some kind of correlation between a storm and an emotional storm. Well done, you. You're a creative individual human on this planet. That's all paradigm thinking. My my understanding, my sense around this is actually that the underlying archetypal pattern of what we call weather, because we are products of this environment, is also the underlying archetypal pattern of an emotional landscape so that there is actually you know the idea of, of, of feeling the heaviness or the, the the clouds lifting or or feeling those emotional storms isn't just a metaphor used creatively but is tapping into that underlying patternicity of expression or feeling that that to take that further would then say the weather is a manifestation of that underlying form in in the material mm. yeah i'd agree with you I, I think that it's i used to think that you know myths and metaphors were exactly what you said in the first like just oh this is just all us making up fancy things and it's very poetic and it's all very beautiful and fine but over the last few years i've developed a new appreciation for for metaphor and symbolism and mm -hmm. myth and how it perhaps does represent something much deeper it's not just us looking for imaginary associations so yeah it's definitely an interest of mine as well mm -hmm. <laughs> well we'll pick that up next time we talk uh bethany it's been an absolute pleasure do you have anywhere you could point people for your work any projects you're working on uh places that people could find more about you so I guess the main one would be my website so it's just bethanybutzer.com and there I'm usually publishing um I have a research page where I usually, if I manage to keep it up to date, I put my most recent academic publications. And I used to write a blog, but I haven't been blogging much lately. It's more social media, so mm -hmm. Instagram uh, or Facebook. So my Instagram is at Bethany Butzer, and then the Facebook has a PhD on the end of my name. And I post little mini blog posts or I post ideas about what I'm working on. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on on synchronicity with a few different projects uh, there. So that's where I would be posting about those, mm -hmm. those projects. Bethany, thank you so much. I, I really, I just really appreciate what you're doing in this world and, and the way that you're, you know, you're having the courage to, like you say, it wasn't easy getting this in a you know, peer reviewed, but having the courage to pursue these different ways of thinking and interpreting the world. And I'm sure that it's going to have a, a huge, huge benefit you know, all around. So thank you for that. Oh, thanks, Ricky. Yeah, always a pleasure to speak with you. Um, we you always too. have really interesting conversations. So yeah, I look forward to speaking again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Mind That Ego podcast. To stay up to date, you can join the Mind That Ego mailing list if you head to mindthatego.com slash MFM. 
you'll also get a copy of my book, Mindsets for Mindfulness, when you join. You can also follow Mind That Ego on Facebook and YouTube, where the podcasts are also displayed in video format, along with other inspired videos that I create. Or if Instagram is more your social media of choice, you can follow me at Ricky underscore Deriz, that's D-E-R-I-S-Z.